It's my uh, pleasure to welcome Lars to our first session. Welcome Lars and thank you so much for taking time for us today. Thank you very much for the invitation. Happy yeah, to great be. to see you. How have you been the last months? Uh, very good actually. I, uh, I was on vacation now for one month in, uh, in France. My parents have a little house in, uh, in uh, Brittany so we went to visit them and then we went uh, to two other places and yeah and I mean it was a very strange time with Corona we got a lot of uh, cancellations for concerts etc etc but also we uh, we just moved uh, just before Corona and uh, to a bigger house so um, and to the to the countryside so actually during Corona I was quite uh, quite happy to be in a bigger house to practice to have finally time again to practice a lot and uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think also the, the teaching went, uh, I think, surprisingly well. What I liked a lot is that uh, I think because students had to record themselves a lot more, uh, the, um, it, the, the, the progress went actually, actually almost faster than, than without Corona. So, oh, really? so, so I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was quite happy with the, with the time. I like to practice also, so so for me uh, it was uh, nice to be at home and to uh, to have time for that. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's your sec. You you've done your second year at uh, Den Haag Royal Conservatory, and uh, how was it the second year besides uh, the virus and the, the lockdown? Yeah, it was uh, it was very nice. Actually, I went from uh, I started uh, in two thousand eighteen, and then I had um, three students. And last year I went from three to, to eight, so it was quite a big change. I had a, I had a, yeah, quite a, quite big class suddenly together with uh, with Raf Hekma. Like we have both our own um, our own students, and we share the the group lesson. So uh, we suddenly had uh, yeah, before we had uh, seven or eight students, and then we had uh, twelve this year. So it was uh, uh, a real class. So uh, yeah. It was quite a change, but uh, but I like that. Oh, that's great! So it's really growing. Yeah, it's really growing, and uh, next year we will have again uh, around twelve people. So okay. that's nice. Um, do you have any advice for like young musicians and saxophone players during these times when you're like starting your career and there were not a lot of opportunities to play and do concerts? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think there are a lot of things you can. Um, you can do in 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 these times uh, which is one is is practice i mean uh, <laughs> you have a lot of time to practice that's never that's never bad and on the on the other hand i think um be creative with plans you want to make and uh, search for inspiration so so i would say practice learn and and let uh, search for inspiration and and also you can get things done that maybe you you didn't do before i don't know make your own website or things that cost a lot of time that often in the when you're going when you're studying playing concerts they 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 get a bit to the background and i think use this free time then to to do this big uh, big frogs that normally you don't uh, you don't want to that you push aside yeah, that's great advice, I think. Yeah. Um, you have been part of the Berlage Quartet for about 11 years now? Yeah, we started in 2008, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, how, how is it to play with like the same persons for such a long time? Well, roughly the same persons? Yeah, yeah, we started um, with, uh, with my sister and with uh, Peter and, uh, and Kirsten and then um, two years ago, yeah, two years ago, my sister decided to stop. So she wanted um, to have a fixed job and uh, to live in Germany. She was a bit tired of traveling and to have the, the insecurities of, uh, of a freelance life, which we, which we have as a, as a quartet. Um, I think it's, it's, it's very nice. You get to know, uh, you get to know your colleagues better and better. And I think what is maybe the nicest is that you that at a certain in the beginning 
it, it, there is you, you you get you get to know how to how to deal with things you, you you find the the most efficient ways you know the qualities you know also the 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 not qualities of of people and and you start to getting yeah to to find the um, the good way how to direct it i think that's uh, you get wiser and wiser yeah are there some like special ingredients that you need for like a successful chamber group or quartet? I think there are there are quite a lot. Yeah, I think I think you need a lot of things. It's it's very it's a big palette that you need. First, I think the you need to play good and you need to work on on that and to continue to work on that. And uh, yeah, we went. Uh, we took a lot of lessons with other instrumentalists, like with uh, recorder players for old music. And then uh, also at a certain time we went to, we did a master with the string quartet in, uh, in Berlin with, uh, with the Artemis quartet. And I think that's, that's very important to, to continue to grow artistically. And at the same time, it's, it's also having the business, like not forgetting the business part. You need, you need really a mix of uh, being, growing artistically and always also you need initiative to sell your concerts, to, to have new projects, to be creative. So I think creativity, quality, and, and also um, staying curious and, yeah, and, and, and going for the business part also what with yeah. with subsidies with initiatives with uh yeah we we have to we when you're a freelancer you have your own business and this is something i think we have to accept that is it's not uh we cannot uh, just just practice and then hope that the telephone will will ring yeah. this this will not happen we are classical saxophonists <laughs> nobody needs us uh so we have to create our own I think you have to turn it around. You have to create the need by making something that people in the end want, want to have. But it's not that there's a, we, we don't sell milk or something that people will buy anyway. So you have to come up with things. Yeah. yeah great metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, what better way to get to know you and the quartet by listening to one of your latest projects.
Wow, such beautiful and immortal music from Johann Sebastian Bach. Where, where, come, where did uh, this idea originate to make an arrangement of like this monument of classical music? Yeah, I unmute myself. Uh, I think we already had this idea for quite a long time. Uh, I remember that Peter came up with it already um, in the beginning. We did a, in 2009, no, in 2010, we did a competition in Germany and we got a scholarship there. And then afterwards you had, uh, you came into a management and for one, co for one year you had like um, 30, I think we, we played between 30 and 40 concerts in Germany and we had to make uh, four programs that then uh, the concert organizations could uh, choose a program and I think already then Peter wanted to play uh, the Goldberg Variations but then uh, it didn't get through uh, so um, I think I was the one now who uh, who was bringing it up again I did my own uh, solo CD with Baroque music with works by uh, solo works for soprano saxophone by Bach and um, and I got more and more fascinated by uh, by this music so um we played we played some works of Bach and then we were looking for a yeah for a big big thing and we were did we want to do the uh, out of the fugue then we were thinking or uh, Goldberg and then we thought let's uh, let's go for Goldberg Aurelia already did the out of the fugue let's do that later <laughs> was uh, yeah what is like the the new light that you yeah that on the this beat? was um the idea we had was um, actually we wanted to to get a subsi uh, subsidy for it, uh, so subventions, um, and then uh, we thought that it's a long piece. It's like thirty-two variations, so it's like one hour and uh, and, and, and ten minutes of, of music. Uh, what can we do to keep the attention of uh, of the people without? Um, yeah, without making things that actually uh, distract you from the from the music. So we came up with the idea of trying to have the character of all the variations very clear by uh, having a different instrumentation. So we uh, we 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 bought a bass saxophone. Actually, we 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 got funding for a bass saxophone. So now uh, now I have a bass at home. I'm <laughs> I'm practicing bass. Um, and we were trying with um, like breaking up the, the the normal quartet setting actually. So we 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 play variations with soprano, tenor, and bass, with bass, uh, tenor, baritone, and alto. And um, and actually, we were looking a long time for uh, for which variations in which instrumentations were really like trying. Oh no, this doesn't work. Maybe two altos and. Uh, I think we spent like three months rehearsing and looking for the instrumentation. And then um, we did a um, theater project uh, three years ago where we worked with, um, with a choreographer and a, and a theater director. And we liked that a lot to, to get away from the music actually and to have these theatrical parts uh, enforcing the music, like not going against it, but trying to, to, to bring it together. And then we um, thought, okay, now we have all these instrumentations, but then you have a variation that is uh, the duration is one minute. So you have one minute you play and then you change from bass to tenor. And then this also takes one minute, like, okay, this was not possible. So then we thought, can we not find something where, uh, where we can kind of integrate this in movements? And then we thought about choreographer. And with the light, this was an idea we had, um, that uh yeah somehow to to have a story with with lightning um with this whole uh goldback variations to yeah to to get your to keep your attention better through such a long piece and uh, and finally we made something where we are have cubes and light is coming out of these cubes we have kind of light light installation and um, this is changing during the piece and also our positions in these cubes are changing and we are actually making one fluent 
uh, journey from the first area to the to the last area, which uh, is very uh, <laughs> very hard. We play everything by heart, um, and was a lot of work, but very uh, rewarding. I think the the for the public it it really works uh, to yeah to have these other things. I think sometimes a chamber music concert is a bit too boring for for these times. I mean, if it's played great, I think there's actually it's it's still it's still great. But our times are changing. We get more and more visual and the mobile and and so we wanted to go a bit with this. And yeah, we heard like when when people of our age come come to our concerts, it's a bit like yeah, okay, but you're sitting there all the time, and then this music it sounds all a bit the same. And <laughs> so we wanted to find and and I think. It's not that you have to change the music, but if you change the setting a bit, this was what we were hoping for, that uh, it, that it gets more more attra attra attractive. And this is what we got back from the public also. So uh, I, I, I hope it worked. Did you have many performances already? Yeah, we had, uh, actually we had now five and nine got canceled because of Corona. And we will have uh, some more uh, in, uh, like, at the end of the year and then also next January and February, I think we have uh, 10 concerts in, in these two, three months, I think, January, February, March. And I hope that then uh, we, we can play them. And you will record them? Maybe? Yeah, and, and, and uh, we will make a CD. Uh, like, like now, during Corona, we were thinking like, what, what, what can we do? And then we, uh, no, a lot of people did, um, did these playing together things with uh, the split screen yeah. somehow we thought like we want to um yeah we we, <laughs> we want to play together and to have a to have it very very good like more the 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 things we normally do do also like rehearse and, and play and then and and not everyone plays its parts with uh with distant and uh, yeah. Which can work great, but which which was not what what we wanted to do. So we thought, like, man, maybe the best thing we can do then is uh, is, is record a CD that we don't need, we don't need the public for that and the concert hall. So so this is what we can do now. So this we we uh, yeah we decided to go for the CD recording. Did you have like any recordings or players, keyboard players that inspired you? In yeah, uh, a lot. Yeah, I um, I listened to a lot of different uh, ones. Um, I, I I like the version of uh, of, of, of Califax with a different like Califax is a reed quintet. My colleague and, and the Hague plays in it. It's a saxophone, two clarinets, bassoon, and oboe. And I think this was for us a bit an example in 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 this instrumentation idea that you have that you can make out of all these variations. You can make the character of every variation even more clear by playing different instruments. And also, Juani, our tenor player, had uh, was was very keen on that because she played it with. She has a wind quintet in uh, in Barcelona, and she played it in this arrangement. And she said, like, it's so great that you have all these all these different colors of the instrumentation. It would be such a pity to have just the saxophone quartet. So that's why we were looking for that. And um, there was uh, I, I forgot. I think Marie Rosa Günther, a, a German pianist, I liked a lot. And uh, yeah. I, I I listen to a lot of uh, different ones. There's also one with the uh, with the um, uh, recorder quintet, yeah. which is uh, seldom seen. They are they are called. They're from Amsterdam. Also, they studied actually with the uh, with the teacher Walter van Hauer, who uh, who coached us also a bit in this uh, in this playing uh, playing Bach and uh, in the Baroque style. And that's also a very nice version. So so I I I liked actually the the wind versions. They make a you make kind of a new piece out of it. Yeah, great. Okay, let's go to our topic of yeah. the session. It's quite frightening, actually. Tools for preventing stage fright. Yeah. Yeah, what, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see from your students or other young saxophone players? Like on stage? Uh-huh. I think... Um maybe the the biggest thing is that we too often expect that things are solving itself so that we don't accept the 
the struggle of it and and try to go around it and then it it will uh, <laughs> it will catch you so what i mean is is for example with uh, with being being nervous i think it's very normal to be to have a bit of tension and uh, and to to yeah to be nervous in a way nervous is, is sounding a bit negative i think it's 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 also you can also say uh, that you're excited to uh, to play a concert it's i, I think it, it would be it would be strange also if, if if you present what you worked on and and you uh, and it doesn't do anything with your body that it would be like that you don't care so so, so you care about it so you you get excited your your body is changing um so your heart heartbeat is getting higher etc cetera, etc cetera. and um if you don't do anything with it then then this will go against you on on stage because with a very high heartbeat and a lot of tension you play uh, you play worse but i think there is a kind of um balance you can find where the excitement works in a in a positive way because uh yeah you get adrenaline and and often and, and adrenaline makes you think faster also and makes you uh makes you better also when you have a, a the good mix but yeah. um so this i think is is one thing for example that you yeah that you accept that you get nervous and that you do something with it for example uh, trying to breathe to breathe calmly uh to go outside to to walk a bit um so these kind of things is I think a lot of things you have to accept how it works and and know maybe also and I, I think for example that you get nervous is a very natural reaction and uh, you can if you read about it you can just understand that your body your body is preparing from the <laughs> ancient times for for a mm-hmm. for a dangerous situation so if you know how to how to deal with it then 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 it can help you in the end yeah you were talking that you like very much to study we have a question from uh jorge marquez from portugal and he's asking do you have like any advice to study with more focus and more efficiency Uh (laughs) uh-huh very good question uh how to study with more focus and more efficiency yeah um I think for more focus, it's very good to uh, to plan what you want to study. So to um, to not just start, but to to think to think before you before you play. I, I think very very simple. So and this can already start before the practice room, so that you think about what what do you want to study. Okay. I, I want to do I want to do this this and this and then that you I work a lot uh, with with uh, timers so I want to study a bit basic technique I want to study a bit playing uh, and uh, and uh, learning a new piece and and repertoire preparing it for a concert so then I I, I put a timer on uh, now I do uh, 10 minutes for example um and and I do all the different parts I think what what happens often when we just start then you start then you 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 get stuck somewhere and then and then you didn't do what you maybe wanted to do so i think planning in in this can help and and the timer can also help i think and more efficient i think the more things you can do on a daily basis the more efficient you will get so what i mean is working on your basic techniques like long notes staccato uh, overtones scales these kind of things um everything is better if you do it every day a bit than to do once a week a session of now i do scales and then you do two hours of scales because and this is just connected to how we learn we learn a lot during sleeping so it's like you you put something in your head a new scale or whatever or just repeating the scale and focusing on the sound and and then it your brain works goes on working so when you sleep the connections in your brain are, are, are made and when you start the next day again some things happened and you you continue to work so i i i think it's very efficient to to do a lot of things as daily as as possible and in this try to have a balance to work on basic techniques also 
daily, not once uh, once every three weeks you do long notes or something. No, like I, I, I just read that, for example, Yo-Yo Ma, the famous cellist, he always starts with five minutes of, of long notes. Yeah. So, so this kind of uh, the importance thing. of basic, yeah. yeah. And, and the importance of basic things don't don't put them away. It's not that you play scales when you are in the conservatory and afterwards it's it's over. It's like mm -hmm. continue to do to do it. It's it's part of uh, I think being healthy. It's like it's like the fitness of of, of your uh, of your craftsmanship of, of of playing the instrument, and then a lot of things as daily as possible. So better short but daily than once a week i think this is uh, maybe the biggest tip i would have for uh, for efficiency and it seems not efficient i think it, it, you, you have to uh, surrender to this idea that you go very slow then in a way it, it feels sometimes better to do two hours of long notes but if you do five minutes every day it's mm -hmm. it's, it's scientifically better yeah i remember uh, an interview from isaac perlman who says to his, to his students that they don't have to study more than three or four hours a day. Is that something? But you have to study every day. Every day of your life, you pick up your instrument, but yeah. don't do like eight or nine hours. Is that something that you agree with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, this is something I found also in a lot of... Uh, you know, I, I, um, I was very interested in studying and I read a lot of books about how to study and, uh, and tips for studying and this was something that came back a lot like the and maybe it's something new a bit also i think um the brain research made a big big step in the last uh, 20 years and this knowledge is not yet in the in the music system i think in the music system you still have a lot of, uh, uh, you still have a lot the the old-fashioned way of uh, eight hours a day and mm -hmm. and i think there are also people like to make a, <laughs> i have the feeling people like to make their own legend in, in in this already also i i remember at the conservatory also some colleagues who said like yeah i studied eight hours today and then i thought like wait we came the, at the same time and and you spent three hours in the canteen this so so this you don't count then or what like studying is is yeah he was sitting in the canteen and drinking coffee and was counting this as, as study time yeah, which I mean, <laughs> the same thing I said. Your brain works on; it's part of your study time, but it's not. The, the problem is you you create the image that you spent eight hours with your instrument. Other people think that then, and then they think, oh, but I should this, do this too. And it, but it's against your body, against your brain. You get tired, you get tensed, and and you you get injured uh, in in the worst case. So so I think it's very important to to know that scientifically it works best to study three, four hours. I mean, it's a perman, he's is, is not a young guy. He already discovered this. So it, it's, it's also not a new thing, but I think in the music world, there's too many, there are too many legends who say that they study uh, 10 hours a day and then you think that you have to do the same, but it's just not, it's just not true. Also, when you, <laughs> when, when you study three, two days for, for six hours, it's 12 hours, and then you take one day off, uh, you have 12 hours so that's the same as if you would so you practice two days you take one day off if you do three days but you don't take a day off then you do four hours a day and you have the same amount so i think also it's uh yeah three to four hours i completely agree it's it's already a lot i think yeah. finding a good balance is important yeah okay um let's take a look to one of your performances and i have some questions also afterwards. Huh?
Bravo. <laughs> yeah, what, when I look at you, when you play this Alamander, you seem relaxed in a way, controlled and also very expressive. Is that, is that also the way that you feel when you play? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, I, um, I, I wouldn't say I, I always feel, uh, feel relaxed. I, I think that's maybe the, the, at least what I remember what you said, like relax and expressive, these are two parts. I, uh, I remember when I practiced this morning, I was, I was focusing on these two. I have the feeling this is, these are both, these are both a never ending uh, story to find the, to find a mix in, in this, the moment you, 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 ex you want to express a lot, you, you start to, uh, to tense up also somehow this is a, this seems to be a connection, but at least this, this happens when, when, when I play but, and, and I try to, to be aware of, of this tensing, but without losing expression then. So, so to find, to find a way to play the musical thought, but also focusing on, on, on body, on, on body awareness. This is something I learned actually with um, a lot. I think I, I, maybe in this already a lot of people told me when I was a student, but uh, the, the string quartet, the Atomist quartet, they were focusing on this a lot, like on, on being super expressive, like really going for the character of the piece and, 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 and until the end and think about the music and then really going for it like a, like a theater actor. And at the same time, like not having, having this, but always find the, yeah, like that your body is not working against it, but that you see your body as part of the, of, of your sound, uh, sound box. Uh, like it's also resonating as, as a sound resonator. So if you tense up, you can, you can try to make a beautiful sound, but it, it will, uh, yeah, like simple tricks. I, I remember that, that once the viola player told me like, yeah, you go up uh, to play a higher note so you shouldn't go up with your body also, but your body should go down. And then he said like that he learned that from singers, if, if singers do a la da 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 da, they, they, they in, in choirs, they move their hand the, the opposite direction sometimes. So la la da 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 da. So, so you make a counter movement with your body. And, and this is, I think a simple technical trick and trick in a way, if you are aware of what your body is doing, which can help a lot. You play time, time, and like you, with your body, you don't do the same movement, and 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 this, so you stay grounded. Yeah, this was where things I, uh, yeah, I I, I learned then. Um, in general, I think I'm also a. It's 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 also a bit my character. I think I'm a, I, I I can be very expressive, but I'm also very calm. So, so it's uh, it, with it's, me. Yeah. yeah. It's a bit of a mix of these things. Yeah. Do you have like a, a ritual that you go through? Not maybe not before the concert, but also days before the, the concert leading up to, to this event? Um, I think that's, uh, that's changing as I learn more and more about it. Uh, like, uh, yeah, every time I, I learn again in it, what I, what I discovered now it is that I um, that you don't have to forget to practice the playing through also, so that you actually this I found in one of the study books I I was reading that you have to divide your practicing in input and in output. And input is then that you learn things and that you you, you try to 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 make it better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then that you also have to so, so you made it better, you practiced things very slowly, you made small uh, improvisations, whatever, you played it with metronome, you played just the beginning, the end, but then also to practice the moment of performance so that you say, okay, and now I record it. So now I play it through in concert mode because this is also something you have to get used to. It's like, 
<laughs> she, she wrote in the book, it's like, you have to get used to being, to getting disappointed, uh, to getting disappointed. Like a lot of things you worked on then don't go completely well when you play it through. But when you do that more often, more and more will go also well there. So, so, so this is something new I discovered now uh, going to uh, performances. Also something we do more with the quartet now. Uh, yeah, so working on the, also just the concert moments. You, you, and not only with one tryout, but, but practicing the concert moment. So having work on something and then play it through. Okay, yeah. how did it go this playing through? Oh, I, I only did the half of what I worked and then go back. And then I think a routine is in a way this, that, I, that I often start with basic things to get a bit to the instrument and then, and then practice. So I, I, I try to have the mix of, of basic and working on pieces. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember that I saw the video of, uh, of, of Misha. You mean, I think he made some very nice yeah. tutorials about uh, how to practice in, um, in Corona time. And, and he, he said like, if you play normally three hours, I mean, that's Misha hours then, three hours of, uh, of technique and four hours of repertoire. If you only have seven minutes, then you do three, three minutes of technique and four minutes of repertoire. And I think this is kind of what I, what I try to do also a lot, to have this balance always. Yeah. I would like to like dive deeper into lit literature and like things that inspired you. I found this quote from a, 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 an American president about anxiety and about fear, about the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. A famous quote from uh, Roosevelt. Yeah. Are there like books or people that inspired you to do research about fear and, and stress? Uh-huh. Wait, I just have to read it. First of all, let me see if my family is on. Yeah, um, yeah. I think what what a book that uh, that helped me a lot with this was uh, the Inner Game of Tennis, which is um, analyzing actually the way we learn and the way we we see ourselves. I I think we all know this uh, this small devil, like the, like the the voice that is in your head that is like. Uh, while you play, oh, this was out of tune. Oh, this was not good. Oh, you uh, today it's not going so well. Huh? Oh, or, or the other way around that that you think like, oh wow, it's going really well today, and then and then you make a mistake. It's uh, or you're just before the end, and it's like, oh, this went good, and then <laughs> and then it goes goes wrong. And 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 this inner game of tennis book is is uh, talking about that actually you have this voice talking, and you have your your. Uh, your body that is actually knowing a lot of things how to how to do it and how to learn it without this voice that tries to control it so letting go and um, and yeah it's 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 sort uh, sport psychology i think where which where, yeah he was a tennis tennis teacher and uh, in sports i think they they discovered these things that your mental the mental part how important the mental part is that fear and uh, that you don't trust yourself and that you think that it could go wrong and, and, and following all these thoughts uh, can, can work against you while performing. So that for the performance, you need to, to visualize how it goes well uh, and that you can practice these parts, like uh, a top-down passage, for example, that you, that you really imagine the top-down uh, passage sounding good and that you don't go with how it is going when you practice like the and, and that you think that this is then the reality but that you make your own reality by really imagining and singing and and then suddenly it, it, it works and, and then trusting your body actually that he can that, that that your body can do this i think this was a yeah uh, for, for me a kind of beginning of of, of getting interested in this mental side of uh, of performance yes yeah. Are there like other artists that you know or met that are like going deep in this in this subject? With um, yeah, I think I think if you try to search for sport psychologists, you can find you can find a lot of things. I I, I just read a, an an article about the 
English soccer team in the last World Championship, for example, they were, I think it was a younger group and they were playing much better. It was with um, Southgate was the, 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 the coach. And Southgate himself was one of the uh, English team players who, who missed a penalty on a very important, uh, a very important moment. And, and he, he asked uh, um, a mental coach to, to join the, 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 the team. And they, uh, they learned with her, for example, to just to change uh, the language that they were not saying in interviews, like, uh, like the English press, of, of course, is with, with all the, 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 the mirror and the sun and the, a lot of the, the, the boulevard press is, is putting a lot of pressure, I think, on, on, the, on the team because everything you do is like, is, is directly, a whole England is, is watching you. And um, so, so she was working with them on, on saying not what I said in the beginning, actually, this, this is where, where, where I, how I came on it, but like that you don't say, yeah, I'm very nervous and we are afraid of, of tomorrow, but that you say, no, we're excited, we can do it. And, uh, and that this changed the way they, they played and they performed. Would you like to have like a psychologist at the conservatory to help? Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I told my, <laughs> I, I had a meeting with my, uh, with my boss some time ago where I, where I said like, I would actually really like to have a, a, a weekly session for my students with with a sport psychologist because this whole performing part I think is is so important and and more and more sports groups and um, and, and and teams go uh, and then take this this knowledge and and I think in music it's coming it's coming but we don't we somehow also I think it's it's part of the fact that music is not only about sports i mean music is also about your also is a lot about your emotions and about inspiration and about the moment but at the same time there are a lot of parts also that are about performance just very very dry uh, and very very related to sports i remember that anno always said like we are we are we are top sports people we, what we do is very connected to top sports so, so, and I think we can go much further in, in, in learning from, from that top sport uh, part, mental part, and also the body part that, that, our, that, we, that we have to exercise also, that we have to be aware of our breathing, that we, yeah, a lot of sports, uh, top sport people, if you have Roger Federer, he's, he's meditating, he's doing yoga. Uh, this, these are parts I think we sometimes, ah, we just want the divine inspiration and then we play. <laughs> and then it's, 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 yeah, it's also a performance we are working on and the body and the mind are very uh, important for that. Yeah, you made a recording with uh, famous yes. singer Barbara Hennigan. Which piece was it again? Was it Lulu? Uh, Lulu by, uh, Lulu. by Alban Lulu. Berg, yeah. 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 Yeah, you told me about uh, um, an interview that she did about the topic. Yeah. I put it also in the slides, so if people want to uh, look at that, you can ask me for the slide afterwards and you can also like, yeah. uh, go check out these resources. Yeah. And there was also another trumpet player that you talked about. Hakan Hardenberg, yeah. yeah. I think uh, I think in this Sarah's Horn hangout, it's it's a it's a very nice uh, resource of uh, it's it's the trump a horn player of the Berlin Philharmonic, and she's doing interviews with big soloists and with uh, with big musicians, and I think it's very personal, and you get there's a lot to 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 find there. For example, I I found with the, in the interview with Barbara Hannigan, I found two. Uh, Two parts that uh, two books and two two courses that I'm actually reading now. <laughs> I was watching the interview some time ago, and now I remembered it. Maybe because of Corona. One which was is called uh, the Talent Code, which is about um, that that top performance is not only about talent, but a lot about the work behind the talent and the the. Um, the area where you are like the the surroundings but that you can if you practice hard and you take the right teachers and and you go to the right environment you can you can 
you can go there. It's it's a question of of how far you want to go. It's not a question of that God didn't give you the talent, so you were a loser. It's like uh, you can, <laughs> yes, you can. And uh, and the other one was uh, friendly eyes, which I think is is also a very interesting concept. Is that you? This is about the voice. That this voice in your head should be friendly, because if you say to yourself, "Oh, you're such a loser again. You cannot do it." This is just a waste of a waste of energy and a waste of time. Like, if you are not friendly to yourself, like, <laughs> why, why should other people be be friendly? But I think a lot of people uh, have have this uh, this problem that you don't treat yourself already uh, not in the good way. And this is uh, Friendly Eyes, which is also a website that I think is. Uh, I recommended it to my students just uh, during Corona. It's like a sport psychologist who is giving a course about meditation and um, and focus and concentration, and and you can you can do it for uh, with donations. Yeah, I also have uh, the masterclass here. From yeah, Trumpet player. I didn't. Uh, yeah. And I think most of the books that we talked about in a game of tennis. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the in the music. This is a Dutch book. The, it, it's not let yet um, translated. I think it's a pity, but she's trying to get. It's a flute teacher in the Hague. She's trying to get funding to have it in English. This is where I got the the part. What what I said about input and output is from this. Uh, is from this book. I think it's a great book about learning and uh, your brain and how to practice better. And uh, and Don Green, audition success. He's a very famous. Yeah, he, he helped a lot of people with auditions. He's, I think, kind of the the biggest um, mental guy that started taking the sports uh, knowledge to music. Great. I'm also a conductor, and the job of a conductor quite often is also to put the musicians in the, in the right mindset um, to play at their best. And I was like looking around at, at rehearsals and I found also, a, I think, a quote of famous uh, conductor Gustavo Dudamel that like embodies what we have been talking about. Uh -huh. I'm going to show it. I think the concept, we have to change the concept. Maybe we don't feel nervous, we feel excited. <laughs> because maybe if you feel nervous maybe you are not sure so we artists that we perform live we need that adrenaline and yes I feel the adrenaline I shake before concerts <laughs> but no because I'm not sure what I if, if I will do okay or not or better it's because it's so exciting to do that 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 I like but nervous nervous no no, nervous. No. Pre <clears throat> yeah. I didn't know this one, but it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a nice summing up of, of, of what I said, yeah, and what I learned, yeah. Okay. Um, I have also, again, a question from, from Jorge from Portugal, and if anybody else has questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, you were talking also about Altissimo, do you have any more advice to improve the Altissimo range? Yeah. Yeah, I think I I, I did my, uh, in, in Amsterdam we had to do, in our masters we had to, to choose a topic uh, to do a research and I did the research about top tones and I was, my, my question was like, is, is everybody able to play top tones? Which is funny because I think at that time it was not, Top tones made a big uh, development also uh, in in the in the last twenty years. I think now this high register is 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 getting more and more uh, normal for 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 most saxophone players. Because I remember um, I remember a masterclass I had with Christian Wirt and Gap, and he said like, yeah, in twenty years people will uh, will play uh, higher and higher, and, uh, and and they will just be able to do it. Now it's still difficult, but this will go uh, this will go away. And I was kind of intrigued by this by this remark he had, like, oh, okay, so this is because I also thought like, ah, but it's 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 some part of talent maybe to that you can do top downs. And then I I was doing this research, and at the same time I was teaching, 
and then I saw actually the combination of uh, when you teach beginners, they can with with very simple problems they can take a long a long time like. A, I had the example of, of the combination of B and C. It's, it's for beginners sometimes a, a difficult change. And we forget about it because we play uh, 15 years of saxophone and when we start, uh, 10 years of saxophone when we start the conservatory. So, so this is normal for us, but then we get the G, A and, and suddenly we think, ah, why is this not working? Um, so, so this is, I think, one, one big tip for, for, um, for top tones is, uh, start again at the at the very beginning with top tones. I when I was teaching amateurs, I um, when I, when when a student didn't come, I was uh, I, I just took the the um, the book. It's it's called uh, listening, hearing, playing or something. Horelezer Spieler in, in in Dutch, and I was playing everything two octaves higher. So just the beginning of the book, I I, I just put the CD. And I started uh, two octaves higher, and then I realized, what, like, wow, I cannot, I, I, I cannot play this. And then I thought, yeah, yeah, of course, it's logical. It's actually these, these uh, combinations of uh, fingerings I have to make. There, there's a, I have this, I, I, so I, I discovered that I had the same level as my student who was starting the saxophone, <laughs> like half mm -hmm. an hour before, that I with with. Uh, uh, two octaves higher. I, I had the same. I couldn't play it in tempo. I had to play it slower. So, uh, and and I think I realized then. Oh yeah. So so actually, we expect so much from like when when we go to the top downs at the conservatory level, we suddenly expect that we can just go on on the same, on the same speed. But it's like we need all, all this work maybe before like that you start actually again with your first saxophone book but two octaves higher and then i i also when i went to paris to uh, when i studied i, I made the erasmus exchange with uh, with claude de Longle and i studied at the conservatoire de paris cnsm and um there was a uh, a colleague of mine it's miguel angel he is now uh, teaching in um, in san sebastian uh, and, and he said that he was playing closet one octave higher and i thought like wow closet one but that's 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 insane <laughs> but in a way it's like yeah that's maybe the way you have to go for top tones is start at the beginning and then and then go one or two octaves higher to 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 practice this i what i do now because i, I of course you never have the time to start at the beginning of your uh, saxophone uh, books and and play everything octaves higher is i i just take a small part of of what i'm practicing which could be the beginning of the of the Goldberg, and then I go, uh, I play this uh, one octave higher, and then I go a bit half tone lower, half tone higher. Now already, you will have, <laughs> you will you will be able to spend the fifteen minutes without problems. And what is nice, you already have the good um, mental representation of the thing you want to hear because you you practice it one octave lower so you have it in your mind and if you go then high it will go fast so this is one part and I, the second part i think which helps with top tones long answer uh mm -hmm. is uh, really work on the basics I, I i got very inspired by uh by brass players because i i, I thought like ah actually the the um, thing about top tones is over it's overblowing so we have to practice overblowing then and and brass players the whole instrument is is based on on overblowing and what do they do they spend a lot of time on on the basics so really playing chords very slow just with the mouthpiece playing the same exercises over and over again transposing so so i thought yeah with top tones we we maybe have to have more uh, a brass player mind mindset. Yeah, good idea. Maybe yeah. what I think sometimes is that the saxophone is, if you compare it to other woodwinds or wind instruments, it's too easy. The fingerings, if you like start on bassoon, when you're young, you have like these crazy fingerings, and for us, it's it's quite quite easy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then and then I think. It's very easy for a lot of time, uh, for a long time, but then with the top tones actually comes something, which maybe what you say other instruments already have from the beginning. The clarinets, uh, they also have um, uh, 
fork uh, fingerings, like these kind of fingerings. But for them, it's it's normal. So this is also a bit worth what uh, Christian Wirt meant, I think. Like it, it will get normal for us too. But mm -hmm. somehow the bridge between that part and until the the and maybe the side keys are already difficult. But till the high C, somehow this you can learn very fast. It's uh, like what uh, what some brass players say and the. I, I heard this here in the Netherlands, but I think it's probably international. Like the saxophone, you hang it in the wind, and uh, and it's sounding <laughs> like it's, it's it's sounding by itself. Yeah, this can work against us, and I think with top tones, maybe it's a it's a point where we can yeah understand that it's. I think in the end, no instrument is easy. If you want to 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 really learn it go to the end it's all the same but for the beginning the saxophone can go very far easily yeah yeah i think it's quite similar with with piano you can just well it's very easy in the beginning but to be a yeah. good pianist yeah that's another thing yeah um yeah there was also the same question about uh, double toning how to start that and to develop like a good technique for double tonguing yeah um with double tonguing i would um i'm i'm still <laughs> i'm still practicing it now also uh i remember what claude de said like practice it very slow really and and really try to feel where you have to to be often you learn that it's but k is uh, k is too too much stopping i think the air so more a softer g is is better practice it very slow and i think um practice it every day is maybe the best tip i i i i, I have for it it's this is something i learned in a master class of uh, christian loba i'm not good with um with slap like i i'm I never practiced a lot of slap, and now now I'm 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 doing it more. And he said like, yeah, it, it's it's a, your 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 tongue is a muscle. It's a question of training. Mm. I thought, yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so I think accept that it's a muscle and that it's a question of training. So start start doing it where you are now and practice it the daily. So if you cannot do a slap, I think for for slap. There are a lot of very good uh, things on, on on YouTube now. I think during Corona also um, Valentin Kovalev and his um, and Ayu and um, mm. Zhang they made I think it's called VNA TV. They made some very nice uh, tutorials I think about double tonguing and slap for example. And yeah. so so watch them and and start practicing every day. And and remember it's a muscle, so it's a question of doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more you do it, the the better. Yeah, that's not that's not <laughs> that's not very good because I think you have to practice till you get tired and then stop. And then the, yeah, it's like with running, like when when you go running, you you have to push a bit the limit, but you don't have to go over the limit. You have to be. This is called deliberate practice. I think that's also uh, very nice to watch. Maybe some there are some nice movies about this deliberate practice. It's meaning that you practice on the edge of what you can do like not in the comfort zone not in the frustration zone but at the edge of the of what you at, at your limit yeah and there you learn the most don't keep practicing until your lips or tongues no no and and, and always <laughs> stop before uh, it, it it's a it's a strange it's oh, it's a difficult um, line i think so it's it's practicing at the limit at the limit but listen to your body don't go uh, don't go over it Yes. Okay. Let's listen one more time to you and the quartet. And I think we have beautiful representation of double tonguing and artissimo in this piece. I think the best result is when you have like audience, I think the audience would never realize that you have like a special technique here hmm. in the quartet because you do it so effortlessly and very, very successful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
feed that gives you goosebumps, like in the middle. <laughs> um, I have a question from Josse. Um, he's asking, how can you define a regular class in a conservatory? Do you make any difference between your bachelor and master students in like objectives or repertoire? Ah. Um, yeah, I think um, maybe a small, uh, maybe a difference is, is that with master students, I focus more on repertoire and less on basic technique. So I think that the, the part that the musical part gets bigger maybe like that in the bachelor there's more craftsmanship and but but at the same time i don't have uh i go very much with the student and with with yeah. uh, things at the moment I, I i don't have a lot of uh, a lot of parts that are very specific like i do this and this then and then no yeah more like a flowing motion yeah and uh, and also for the ensemble or something, it's it's all together and the group lesson is all together. Um, yeah, no, I, I I don't think I make a a big difference. If I because if if I feel that um that the master student has a a big basic technical problem, I I will always uh, <laughs> then we will do this yeah. technical problem. <laughs> so it's not. Uh, I also I think. Often we think that it's really about the bachelor and master and then it's finished. It's, 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 it's much longer. It's a bachelor, master, and then, and then life starts. And then you can, you can go and study with a string quartet and then you can go and take lessons with that. Then you are free. And also you continue to learn. I think a lot of things that you learn in the conservatory only years after the conservatory, they kind of settle down and you really understand it and you, you find your own thing and you get uh, better. And I think really when, for the mind, it's, it, we have, it, it's a profession for the rest of our life. It's not, uh, and, and also if you are good and successful now, doesn't mean that 10 years later, you will be the one. It's really, uh, if, if you want it, go for it and you will, you will get it. I mean, I always thought this was a, what a, what a stupid thing to say. But I discover more and more that it's, it's, it's a truth. If you want it, if you want it and you work for it, it's, it's this talent code thing in a way. It's, uh, it's never too late. <laughs> I, I, that's a nice one, I think. It's, ne it's never too late to practice. I remember I, I was playing in the conservatory with, uh, with a friend of mine, a, a Japanese girl, Nanako uh, Toyoka. She's now living in Finland. And um, so I was playing uh, in, in a kind of student quartet with her. And, and just before a concert, she was, she was practicing a, a run. And I said, like, now it's too late. And, and she looked at me and she said, like, it's never too late. And and I think there's this, there's some some Japanese Eastern uh, wisdom in 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 this. Like it's it's never too late. Also, you can if you want it. Our body is is very. You, you see this sometimes with people that are that are very big, and then they decide now I do sports. Now I take care of my of of what I eat, and 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 then you can change your body can change and our so so we can change so if you decide with now that you want to learn slap then then, then what i mean now if, if you decide with 35 then you can also start with 35 learning it you will be i mean you have a long way to go then but other people also had this way but they did it earlier it's just a question where you start your uh, <laughs> Your, your 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 new thing and i think this is uh, something to remember don't don't get uh, don't think that the conservatory is is the end it's it's the beginning and if you decide today that you want to go in this direction then if you go there with daily work and and inspiration and you you like this way then then you you will get there what are you like most excited about for the near future what are your your ah, project um, before it for i think now uh very much the the, the cd recording with uh with goldberg i'm now um <laughs> uh i i play the bass and the soprano so for five variations i'm playing bass saxophone and i think it's very 
difficult music in a way to to really understand and and, and you can play it in so many ways and, and and to find your way in it is 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 quite hard and now i'm very busy in in, in being able to play bass saxophone like on the level i can and i can play the other saxophones which is kind of kind of a challenge because it's it's such a yeah i mean also it's it's a difficult instrument but at the same time i i started this this is one example i started this instrument actually earlier i, I was playing bass in a, in a in a german saxophone orchestra for a long time so so i know the bass a bit but then i was playing boom 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 and now I'm playing and now I play a, a bass part of, of, of Bach. So I have to do a whole different things. And and maybe some of you play bass, but the, the middle D and E is kind of uh, kind of impossible to, to play. So I play it with alternative fingering. So I have to to learn kind of new, really new, new fingerings. So this takes time, but so I try to I try to do this. So I'm, yeah, I'm excited about about that. And I think also what we um, with the quartet we just got a, a big funding for um, for four years, uh, and we have to to so so we have the money to do a lot of projects. So I'm I'm excited to start all these projects. And then uh, also about the, about the my class in in the Hague, I have um, I think some very nice new students and. Um, still uh, the students I have from last year which where, where I, I like them a lot and I, I'm looking forward hopefully to see them again also not only to teach uh, via screen no actually I'm, I'm looking forward to all my uh, my working parts the quartet and the and the, and the conservatory which are my main parts but also uh, I will play hopefully if everything goes well with the concert orchestra in September we will play uh, Gershwin if if I mean now the orchestra plays, I think, with uh, like a part with with one and a half meters difference uh, distance. So I hope that they w have the space to put the saxophones in, and I hope that they don't cancel the saxophone piece. So well, this is another part. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another question from the audience. Yes. What is a good way to relax your fingers, arms, and body during practice time? It's a question from Lelani. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, um, I think what is actually important is to relax other parts, um, to relax your two parts. So you relax your big muscles in your, uh, in your butt and your upper, upper legs. So, um, because if you relax this part of your big muscles in your legs and in your, in your butt, you you, this relaxes like your, the center of your body, which afterwards relaxes also the, the other parts. So I think focusing on having the big muscles in your legs relaxed and feeling really the ground is helping the, the, the fingers and the arms. So, so this is also something important. A lot of body things, if you have pain here, it often comes from, from here. Mm -hmm. So, so having a, yeah, relaxing the big muscles and, 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 and really grounding with your feet very well, I think is uh, something that can help. Okay. I think that, are, that we have gotten all the questions from the audience. And I want to thank you so much for sharing you. your wisdom today. It was a lot of fun. And um, for the audience, if you want to get to know Lars even better, or you want to check out his uh, recordings, you can go to his website, it's here. And I want to make a little promotion for our next session. In a week, we will have Christian Lauba together with Richard Ducrot, and we will talk with them. So you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram to, to see what we will do. And uh, yes, uh, I hope to see you all there next week yeah. on Wednesday. And thank you, thank you very much, Lars, for being here today. Thank you very much.